All right, are there any questions? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, R yeah, RNA polymerase is basically going to generate an RNA strand, okay? So uh, from, from DNA, right, it's going to generate an RNA strand, okay? Primase is just for producing that primer, okay? It, it is going to produce like about maybe 10 nucleotides or so, right? Whereas RNA polymerase is going to go, a go ahead and produce, uh, you know, it's going to go ahead and tr transcribe the entire gene, right? The prime primase is just going to produce that short stretch that is needed for producing that primer. Okay. And beyond that, I don't know the differences, all right? I mean, like, so you'd have to delve deeper, you know, if, you know, what the, because bo both of them, you know, you have RNA primase, that's a protein, okay, RNA polymerase is a protein, right? What the detailed differences are in their structure, amino acid sequence and so on, you know, I don't know, but this one is just going to produce that short primer and that's the end of the story. The primer is is then going to be cut out, okay? Yeah, because that portion is missing because that portion is made of ribonucleotides, not deoxyribonucleotides. So the primer is going to be cut out, right? And then there is going to be a repair polymerase, okay? So it's like that those ten nucleotides are missing, right? So the repair polymerase is going to put in whatever is needed over there, right? And then there's going to be DNA ligase that is going to kind of stitch everything back together. Yeah, it's good. I mean, you're taking the time to read all the details, you know, which is a good thing, right? Because that's, uh, that's really the intent of this class. And it's not that you have to know all that stuff, but if you have some degree of familiarity, you know, it's going to help you when you're reading papers in, in bioinformatics and these related areas. Right? Otherwise, you know, any new terminology that you hear is going to throw you off. Right? All right, any other questions? So today we are going to talk about chromosomes and gene regulation, right? So basically we are going to look at two things, okay? How is the DNA packaged in, inside cells? Because if you look at the human genome, right, what is the size of the human genome? How many nucleotides do you have in that? Anybody remember? Like how many of those letters, approximately how many of those letters do you have? Like A, G, C, T. If you're looking at a human cell. How much? Not million, it's billion. Okay. Three billion, that's a very large number, right? So you have a lot of information over there, right? But that is really packaged into that tiny nucleus, right? And... Uh, I mean, from what I remember, the earlier version of the book had said it's something, something like, you know, basically taking a thread that is, you know, the size like of a football field, right, and putting it into a tennis ball, right, small tennis ball, right. But the packing is done very, very compactly and very efficiently because it cannot be a tangled jumble over there, right, because if it is, then when you need to do the transcription and all, you, you cannot retrieve the relevant information. So the packaging is done through proteins, right? And it is really compact packing, right? So we will talk about that today, right? And then also we will look at gene regulation because remember I said, you know, other than the reproductive cells, all the cells from the same organism, they have exactly the same DNA, the same three billion letters, right? But not every gene is expressed in every cell, right? So how does the cell decide, you know, which genes to express and which not to express, right? So what is the mechanism by which genes start producing uh, the corresponding RNA and then the, the corresponding protein, right? That's what we want to take a look at today. Okay, makes sense, right? I mean, based on whatever we have considered so far, this is the next step. So in this chapter, we study the organization of DNA inside cells and the various factors that play a role in determining whether and to what extent a particular gene is going to be expressed in a cell. What does it mean for a gene to be expressed in a cell? You select a bunch of nucleotides and do what? So you copy, them. copy them into what? Into, into, into RNA. RNA, yeah. Yeah, the process of copying from DNA to RNA is called transcription, and the corresponding gene is said to be expressed. You know. So I'm mentioning this just to reinforce whatever you've already learned. Okay. So uh, the genome of an organism, again, the genome is a collection of DNA, right, that is there in, in, in the... Uh, nucleus of the cell of that organism, right? Or, or if, if, it, if it is a prokaryote, it's basically the collection of DNA, you know, that is needed for producing that organism, right? So the genome of an organism encodes all of the RNA and protein molecules that are needed to make itself. So you have all the information to produce a completely new organism, right? However, not every gene needs to be expressed all the time. And even the simplest single-cell bacterium can use its genes selectively 
switching genes on and off, right? Gene turning on means it's getting transcribed, right? The corresponding portion is getting copied into RNA. Off means it's not getting transcribed. So the ba even the bacterium can do that so that it makes different metabolic enzymes depending on the food sources that are available to it, right? So if you have lactose, right, you should produce the enzymes that are need needed for metabolizing lactose, right? If you have glucose, then enzymes needed for metabolizing glucose and so on. Now in the case, so this is for, even for bacterium, you see that, okay, that gene expression is under pretty tight control. And in multicellular organisms, it's out, even under more elaborate control, right? Because almost all the cells of a multicellular organism, with the exception of the reproductive cells, they contain exactly the same DNA, right? And the apparent differences in the cells are caused by the fact that different cell types express different genes. Like if you're looking at the red blood cells, you know, they're expressing different genes, right? If you're looking at the hair cells, different genes, bones, different genes, right? Liver, right? Kidney, whatever, right? So they, so, and things look different, right? Because different genes are being expressed, but all the cells have exactly the same, same DNA. Now, how is the DNA organized? If you're looking at eukaryotes, right? Again, eukaryotes are, or, uh, organisms, right, whose cells have a nucleus and other organelles, right? So in eukaryotes, the DNA in the nucleus is distributed among a set of different chromosomes, what are called chromosomes, right? And each chromosome consists of an enormously long DNA molecule, which is folded and compacted by certain proteins. Because remember, I said there has to be a large degree of compaction because you have so much of information, but you're going to have to squeeze that into a little tiny space, right? And this is carried out uh, by the activity of some proteins, and the complex of DNA and protein is called chromatin, right? And in addition to the DNA packaging proteins, chromosomes are also associated with proteins that are involved in DNA replication, DNA repair, and gene expression, because the DNA is packaged inside the chromosome, right? But if you're going to replicate the DNA, then some, the DNA replication machinery and all, all those other proteins, right, including DNA polymerase and all, they have to get access to the DNA, right? So the chromosomes have to interact with them. Same thing for transcription, right, and so on, right? Now, if you're looking at bacteria, on the other hand, the DNA is organized into one circular chromosome, right? They don't have so many chromosomes. Like, we have linear chromosomes, right? But in, in the case of bacteria, all the DNA is organized into one circular chromosome, and this is carried out by some proteins, but not too much is known about the details. Again, the caveat here is that not too much was known when I got the version of these notes, okay? I was just taking a look at the latest version of this book this morning, right? And it has many new things, you know? So I, it's just that I don't have the time to cover all that stuff and do the plant biology. I will mention that, but if you happen to get the latest copy of the book, I think it'll be well worth your time. For example, like if you have, if you're looking at the DNA sequence of a human, all right? Now, if there are mutations in certain locations, all right? There are mutations that are called single nucleotide polymorphisms, where at a particular location, maybe an A has changed to a G or something, right? In many cases, it doesn't matter, but there are cases where this thing will map onto a disease, okay? So the earlier version of the book that I actually read in 2002, 2003, right around that time frame, it didn't have any discussion of all these SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, right? Now they have that. I haven't read the entire chapter, but I was just taking a quick look at the chapters this morning, right? And, uh, so, uh, you know, as more information, like say, for example, I'm sure they must be talking about what is called next generation sequencing, right? I'll give you the big picture because I will cover regular sequencing and I'll tell you what next generation sequencing is, right? But I think the book has a lot more details, right? And, you know, it, it'll be nice to know those things because if you go out and start looking at papers and all, they will use those things, right? But uh, you'll have some idea about what it is, but if you need to know some of the, you know, detailed protocols, right? then it might be good to uh, take a look at the book, right? I'm just letting you know that. But if, if this course were only focused on just genomics, okay, not plant genomics, then probably, you know, that extra month at the end, I would have had time to, you know, cover those things in detail, you know, make notes from them, but I, I cannot, right? But I'm just letting you know that information is available right. in, in the book. So you don't have to look, oh, you know, all over the literature and go searching, you know, for information. Now, in uh, prokaryotes, as I said, the DNA is organized into one circular chromosome. This is carried out by some proteins, but not too much is known about the details, right? But I, I don't know for a fact that, you know, more is known today than was known, let's say, 15 years ago about this organization, right? But I'm just mentioning that the book does have new information that you will find useful. 
Now, if you're looking at human cells, then with the exception of the germ cells, that is the egg and the sperm, each cell contains two copies of each chromosome, one inherited from the mother and one from the father. So humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes, right? So the two copies are called homologous chromosomes. The one inherited from the father is called the paternal homologue, while the one inherited from the mother is called the maternal homologue. Right. And the only non-homologous chromosomes are the sex chromosomes in males, where a Y chromosome is inherited from the father and an X chromosome is inherited from the mother. Right. So these are non-homologous chromosomes because they're not... Homologous means very similar but not exactly identical. Right. So if you look at, other than the X and Y chromosomes, all the other chromosomes, they occur in pairs, and the sequences are very similar but not exactly identical. Right. Now, uh, so for, for males, there is an X chromosome and a Y chromosome. And for females, they have uh, homologous sex chromosomes since they inherit X chromosomes from both parents. Any questions so far? Now, how do you distinguish one chromosome? So you, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. Okay, How do you distinguish them under a microscope? All right? Well, what you can do is you can do staining. right? So the standard way of distinguishing one chromosome from another is to stain them with dyes that bind to certain types of DNA sequences. right? Because we know there are two kinds of pairing. All right? A pairs with T. Right? If, uh, uh, an A on one strand, A nucleotide is going to pair with T on the other. G is going to pair with C on the other. Right? So if you have some dyes, that can distinguish between DNA which is rich in AT nucleotide pairs from DNA which is rich in GC nucleotide pairs, then along each chromosome you'll be having a pattern, right? Different color for the dye as you go along, right? And so this characteristic pattern of bands could be used as an identifier for each chromosome, and that's, uh, such a pattern is called a karyotype, right? Again, this is just some terminology. And since the pattern for each chromosome is unique, these bands can be used to distinguish one chromosome from another. All right, under the microscope, just look at the pattern and, and distinguish. Now, if you see a problem in the pattern, okay, then there is a problem with the chromosome, right? Like, let's say for chromosome number 10, you expect a particular pattern. But when you do the karyotyping, right, let's say from a field sample, right, before a child is born, if you see a difference, right, that means something is messed up in that chromosome, right, making that unborn child susceptible to some disease at a later point in life, you know. Or, or maybe even immediately after birth. So this information, this karyotyping, can be used to search for chromosomal abnormalities which characterize certain inherited birth defects at the prenatal stage, and it can predispose individuals to certain ty types of cancers. Right? Yeah. Any questions? So they do a test. I mean, that's called amniocentesis, right, which is basically take out some of the amniotic fluid right, before a child is born, and from that because there'll be some cells in that amniotic fluid, right? And they can do run that test and see if, if there are, you know, potential birth defects. Now, if you look at the cycle of a cell, uh, right? Uh, or the life cycle of a cell, it's basically grow, divide, grow, divide, okay? And the division, if you're looking at eukaryotic cells, because eukaryotic cells have a nucleus, right? So the kind of division that they employ, it, it requires nuclear division. The information in the, DNA, in the nucleus has to be replicated. That is, the DNA has to be replicated and properly divide, uh, has to be properly divided to form two nuclei, right? So th that process of nuclear division is called mitosis. So if you're looking at eukaryotic cells, which is mainly what we are going to focus on, in the case of eukaryotic cells, so you'll have a, two phases in the life cycle, okay? One is mitosis, when the actual nuclear division takes place, all right? And the rest of the time, the cell is growing, replicating DNA and producing proteins and so on, all right? And that is called interphase, right? Because without, without you know, this growth phase, if you keep on dividing the cell, replicating with every division, the cell is going to get progressively smaller in size, okay? That happens. The first few cell divisions of a fertilized egg, you know, that's what happens, right? But then after that, it has to be like a, uh, like a normal... Uh, mitosis, right? So you have mitosis, you have interphase. So during interphase, that is, from one mitosis you have an interphase and then another mitosis and so on, okay? So during interphase, transcription, translation, and DNA replication take place because the cell has to grow, right? So it has to produce the right proteins, RNA, and so on, right? So these things take place. And so the chromosome is, at a, is an extended state. So the chromosome cannot be very packed, right? Because you need to be able to access the DNA you know, order for RNA polymerase, let's say, to make RNA copies, or for DNA replication to take place. Right? So it's not in a compacted state. And uh, so you cannot easily distinguish the chromosomes under a light microscope. 
And these chromosomes, the, the chromosomes in this state of packing, they are referred to as interface chromosomes. Right? In fact, the first uh, you know, case where they were able to identify chromosomes under a microscope is when the cell was actually dividing, when there was nuclear division, because then the chromosomes would be compacted. Right? Now, during mitosis or nuclear division, the chromosomes have already replicated, and then one copy needs to be delivered to each daughter cell. Right? So here it cannot be in an extended state because otherwise everything will get messed up. All right? So you have to package the two replicated chromosomes very compactly and then pull them apart. All right? So the chromosomes in this stage are highly compacted and they are visible under a light microscope and these chromosomes are referred to as mitotic chromosomes. Right? So it's, it's just a difference in the packing stage of the, of the chromosomes or the packing state of the chromosomes. Any questions? Now, in order to ensure that chromosomes replicate efficiently and are correctly apportioned between the two daughter cells during cell division, each chromosome has got some specialized re regions. Right? The first region we have already encountered is called the replication origin. Right? So the DNA replication begins at a replication origin. Right? And let's try to recall, okay, replication origins are rich in what? What sequences? Is it GC or AT? AT, because of the fewer, fewer number of hydrogen bonds, yeah. So most, uh, now, most eukaryotic chromosomes, they'll contain many replication origins because you have to replicate a lot more DNA, right? Whereas for, for bacteria, it's usually just one, one location, right? Then another kind of specialized DNA sequence is what is called the centromere, right? And this, see, basically when the, when the chromosomes become compact, right? before nuclear division, all right? Centromere is, is a specialized sequence at the center of the chromosome, all right? Where some proteins attach and the machinery that pulls the two replicated chromosomes apart is able to attach, all right? So that's the centromere sequence. So the presence of this sequence allows one copy of each duplicated chromosome to be pulled into each daughter cell when a cell divides. We will discuss cell division in detail, all right? There's a chapter that is devoted to cell division, all right? So we'll discuss this in detail, but for now just keep in mind that the centromere helps this, uh, this partitioning of the uh, replicated uh, chromosomes between the two daughter cells, right? So during mitosis, there's a protein complex which is called a kinetochore that forms at the centromere and attaches the duplicated chromosomes to the mitotic spindle. That's the machinery that actually separates out the two uh, replicated chromosomes, allowing them to be pulled apart towards opposite ends of the dividing cell, right? And in fact, that machinery, you know, like one way to treat cancer, I mean, there's a drug, cancer drug called Taxol, right? that is actually an inhibitor for the mitotic spindle. It will it'll not let the mitotic spindle form. So even if the chromosome is replicated, the cell cannot divide, right? Because you don't want, you want to prevent a cancer cell from dividing, right? So, yeah. They isolate that only on the cancer. They cannot, you know, that's, yeah, they cannot. That's, what, that's why it's a problem, right? So it's going to do that even to the healthy cells also, yeah. You cannot. And, and this is also something that we'll talk about later, right? In the beginning, I was thinking that I might not talk about cancer, but I will probably spend one lecture talking about that because we are, I mean, thanks to your cooperation, like you guys are going and studying, right, at home. So I think we are progressing pretty fast. You know, I'm probably on almost on uh, slide number 300, okay? So I think I can cover all the stuff that is in there, right? And then go to the plant uh, thing, you know, which will take more time, but it should be okay. So I'll talk about the cancer thing later on, all right? Uh, and then there is a third DNA sequence that is called a telomere, right? And this specialized DNA sequence is found at, the en at each of the two ends of a linear chromosome, right? Bacteria have a circular chromosome, but if you have a linear chromosome, at each end you will find this sequence that is called a telomere. They contain repeated nucleotide sequences that will enable the ends of chromosomes to be replicated. Because remember, we talked about DNA replication, right? It has to be primed using a primase, right? So, and not only that, on the Okazaki fragments, all right, it has to be done many times, all right. So, if you're looking at a, at a linear DNA molecule, all right, there's nothing to, uh, I mean, like, if you want to copy the entire thing, okay, where are you going to put your primer, all right? The bacteria solve this problem because they have a circular chromosome. So, no matter where you start the replication, there's always some, some place before that to put a primer, okay. In the case of uh, these eukaryotic cells, all right, the problem is solved using telomere because that, that sequence at the end, it attracts an enzyme that is called telomerase, all right, which will make many copies of that, of that region. So that way, you know, with each replication, the, the thing doesn't shorten, 
Okay. There, there is a tendency to shorten. So, t you know, if telomerase is hyperactive, then again you can get cancer because after a certain number of divisions, right, that cell should be kind of thrown away, right? The new progeny should be used, right? So, t if telomerase is hyperactive, then it'll keep on elongating that region, right? So, even after the, you know, required number of divisions, even after that, the cell is going to continue, continue, continue to persist, right? And that's a problem. And so, in some, some cancers, t this enzyme called telomerase is implicated, right? Because you have a hyperactive telomerase, so that the telomere shortening is not happening. But the reason you need this sequence is because to make sure that the ends of linear DNA molecules, all right, are replicated properly. Actually, this is what prompted me to go and take a look at the earlier book, you know, because I was thinking that I need to explain this in a little bit more detail. Let me go and take a look. But my, uh, the earlier book, a copy of my book, that just walked away, okay? So I had to get the new one. The new one, I couldn't trace that thing, but then I had my old notes, so I picked that up from there. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, 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 yeah. But at the same time, if you have hyperactive telomerase, okay, then that's a problem too, right? So too much of anything is a problem. You know, you need some of that, but you know, to, in excess, it's a problem. All right. Any questions? Now, how is the DNA packaged, right? So. Basically, so you, you have these three billion letters, okay, you have double-stranded DNA, right? So the first level of packaging is done uh, using histones, okay? There are eight of them here, one, two, three, four, and then at the bottom, five, six, seven, eight, right? So these form like a bobbin, all right, on which the DNA strand is going to be born, right? Now these histones, they have, uh, these are proteins, all right? Proteins are made of amino acids, okay? they have got positively char uh, charged side chains, okay? Large number of them. So remember, DNA has got, independent of the strand that you have, right? DNA has got a sugar phosphate backbone, right? We talked about the sugar. What is the sugar in DNA? Deoxyribose, all right? And then it has a phosphate. What is the charge on the phosphate? Is it positive or negative? Negative, negative charge, okay? So the sugar phosphate backbone is negatively charged. So if, you, if this, this um, histone here in the center, all right, it carries a large proportion of positively charged amino acids, then it, uh, this uh, winding on that is going to be pretty, uh, you know, uh, t tightly held in place, yeah. So it's, it's like Van der Waal or magnetic Yeah, probably, or electrostatic attraction, yeah. Electrostatic, it's not magnetic. So, an individual nucleosome core particle consists of a complex of eight histone proteins, two molecules each of histones, 2A, 2B, 3 and H4, don't ask me for the differences between the different histones, okay? They probably have different amino acids and, you know, have different shapes. But the thing is, bottom line is that all of this stuff fits together to produce this bobbin on which the, on which the DNA strand, double-stranded uh, DNA can be wound. And in trying to wind this once, you have 146 base pairs, right? Nucleotide pairs. And, uh, and then the stuff in between, going from one bobbin to the next, that is called linker DNA. That's about 50 base pairs. Okay, so so e, so the nucleosome is basically one bobbin like this with DNA wound around it and linker. Okay, so that's about 200 base pairs long, right? So this arrangement, right? This winding of the DNA on the histones, it reduces the length of the DNA by a factor of three, right? And there are additional levels of packaging. You know, not all of that is understood. And again, I mean, the caveat is in 15 years, maybe people have understood some more, right? And that's not very relevant for us electrical engineers, okay? But I'm saying that they, they might have understand, understood some more. But the bottom line is that at the end, you know, this thing is, is reduced in size a lot, okay? There's a lot of compaction. So the term nucleosome refers to a nucleosome core particle plus the adjacent DNA linker about 50 nucleotide base pairs long. So everything together is about 196 or 200 nucleotides long. So the formation of nucleosomes converts the DNA molecule into a chromatin thread approximately one-third of its initial length. And as I said before, histones are small proteins with a high proportion of positively charged amino acids. This is going to make sure that the histones bind tightly to the negatively charged sugar phosphate backbone of DNA, regardless of the precise nucleotide sequence. Right? It doesn't matter which sequence you're looking at. And there are additional levels of chromatin packing, one of which is facilitated by a fifth histone 
H1, which is thought to pull the nucleosomes to, uh, closer into a regular repeating array. Now, one thing I should mention is that, you know, see the information that you have in the DNA, okay, that is the information that you got from your parents and all that. That's like something that is set in concrete. In addition, there are other things that happen, you know, that, uh, so this is called genetic information, right? Epigenetics refers to modifications of that, right? For example, there could be methyl groups that are put somewhere on the DNA, right? Let's say in the histones, okay, where the DNA is packaged, maybe methyl groups are put, put on there, okay? That will prevent like RNA polymerase from getting on it, right? Or, you know, you could have acetylation, right? So these things are referred to as epigenetic modifications, all right? And they also play an important role in gene transcription, although it's not, I mean, the, 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 uh, this version of the book didn't discuss that, right? But I think the latest version does talk about it, right? So keep that in mind. You have the permanent information, but there can be modifications, all right? Like where in, in some places there could be acetylation, right? There could be methylation and so on, right? And uh, those are epigenetic changes to the DNA, right? That could, uh, you know, either prevent the DNA from being transcribed or cause it to be transcribed more rapidly, right? So these things also, also make a difference, right? It's not there in the notes, but I'm just mentioning that for your information. Now, if you're looking at the interface, if you're looking at the interface chromosome, again, keep in mind, right? The life cycle of a cell, right, is mitosis, that's nuclear division, and then interface, all right? Now, during interface, there's transcription, uh, translation, and uh, DNA replication, all that stuff is going on. The cell is growing in size, producing proteins, and so on, okay? However, the chromatin in an interface chromosome is not in the same packing state throughout the chromosome, all right? Uh, so, heterochromatin is the most highly condensed form of interface chromatin, right? So, we said that if you're looking at mitosis, the DNA is, uh, the chromosomes are, are really compacted, right? In the case of the interface chromosome, it's not that compacted, right? But still, I mean, there, is, there are variations. The cr chromatin, which is in the most highly condensed state, even in the interface chromosome, that is referred to as heterochromatin, right? And typically, you'll find heterochromatin near regions which are transcriptionally active. For example, around centromere and telomere regions, okay? Because centr telomere is basically for making, um, for attracting the enzyme called uh, telomerase, okay? For making many copies over there. Centromere, right, again, is for attracting the kinetochore protein so that this, the two daughter cells can be pulled apart, okay? It has nothing to do with uh, transcription or anything like that, okay? So these regions, typically where it's compacted, these are transcriptionally inactive, right? And this uh, heterochromatin typically makes up about 10% of an interface chromosome. Now, a good example of heterochromatin, right, is uh, in the interface X chromosomes of female mammals. So I said before, right, if you're looking, so males have one X chromosome, one Y chromosome, right? Females have two X chromosomes, right? So if you have two X chromosomes, each of them is producing protein, so the double dose would be kind of lethal, all right? So, in the, in the, so for cells in females, all right, one of the X chromosomes is switched off, all right? And this, this happens even before birth, all right? So either the paternal copy or the maternal copy is switched off, all right? And in some of the cells, it's the paternal copy that will be switched off, in some others, the maternal copy, all right? So uh, then in the progeny of that cell, okay, that paternal copy, if, if the originally the paternal copy got switched off, that'll stay, all right? If the maternal copy got switched off, that'll stay in the, in the progeny, all right? So this is propagated, and this is done using this heterochromatin uh, kind of idea where it is compacted, all right? So recall that the female mammals have two X chromosomes because the double dose of the corresponding protein in females could possibly be disastrous. Female mammals permanently inactivate one of the two X chromosomes by condensing it into heterochromatin early in embryonic development, right? And thereafter, in all of the progeny of the cell, the con condensed and inactive state of the X chromosome is propagated, right? And, you know, for, for women, I mean, like, if you look at, uh, let's say, the ears, nose, and so on, right? They might have, uh, you know, different X chromosomes turned off, right? Whereas for men, it's going to be the same, okay, because it's X and Y, right? But the, the one, in some of them, it might be the paternal copy. Some of them, it might be the mater, uh, maternal copy, yeah. Uh, a really obvious uh, example of that is in, like, uh, cats that are calico-colored. Yeah, pro yeah, you're probably right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 you're right, yeah. Now I remember that example from the genetics book. Yeah, they talked about that. Yeah. But again, I mean, I'm not making you responsible for all this stuff. This is just to make the whole presentation more interesting, okay? So, 
So, so heterochromatin is transcriptionally inactive, and the rest of the interface chromatin is referred to as euchromatin. Okay, U means proper, proper chromatin. All right. And if you're looking at a typical differentiated eukaryotic cell, what is a differentiated cell? Differentiated cell means if you have a stem cell, okay, that can produce different cell types. Differentiated means maybe it's become the skin cell, the liver cell or something, okay. It no longer has the capability to go and change into any kind of cell, right. So in a typical differentiated eukaryotic cell, some 10% of the euchromatin is in a state in which it is either actively being transcribed or is easily available for transcription, right. This is known as active chromatin. Again, just terminology, right? So you have heterochromatin, euchromatin, then you have active chromatin, and this is the least condensed form of chromatin in the interface chromosome, right? So, so based on this, you can see that if uh, you're looking at a chromosome, all right, and you take a gene, right, that is in the transcriptionally active region, and you force it to go into, let's say, the heterochromatin region, right, then the transcription will stop, okay? And people have done experiments to see that. Any questions? So we're now going to look at position effects on gene expression. If a particular gene is moved from a region of heterochromatin to a region of active chromatin or vice versa, its transcriptional activity is likely to be altered. All right. For example, if you're looking at yeast cells, okay, you look at the uh, you, you look at the chromosome. All right. So at the end you have the telomere regions, and at the center you have a gene called ADE2 gene. All right. This is at the normal location where it can be transcribed to produce the necessary protein, all right? This is, a, this is a protein that is needed for synthesis of adenine. Remember, the cell has to produce all those nucleotides, so adenine go on inside the same time. So this is a protein that's needed for adenine synthesis, okay? So if it is in the normal location, then you have the white colony of yeast cells, okay? Because adenine is being produced. Now, by some m genetic manipulation technique, and I will talk about that in a later chapter, let's say you move this from here pretty close to the telomere, okay? The telomere region is transcriptionally inactive. If you move this over here, this guy will also become somewhat transcriptionally inactive, not 100%, right? But it, it's not producing as much of that protein anymore. The net result is you're going to see a colony of yeast cells that is red, but there will be white patches here because this is not completely silenced. Okay, the activity has been substantially reduced. It's not completely silenced, so it's producing a little bit of that protein, giving you these white patches over there. Okay, so that is one example. Another example where you can change the activity of a gene is uh, in the case of fruit flies. Okay, so if you look at the uh, a normal fruit fly, the eye, the center of the eye is red in color, right? And the gene that is responsible is called the white gene, which is at the normal location here, right? And let's say here you have heterochromatin on this chromosome, right? By some rare chromosomal inversion, let's say this one moves here, right? And See, again, I mean, if you depend on nature to do it, it can happen randomly, right, in a few cases. Today, we have the techniques. I mean, since the 70s, we have techniques where we can force this to happen. We can cut this thing out and, and shift it over there, right? And then you insert it back in the organism, right? Then you'll see that these, uh, the fruit flies that result, right, they start having eyes that are patched uh, red and white, okay? Again, I mean, it's not completely white because you haven't been able to completely silence it, right? So any, any questions? And these are experiments that have actually been done. Now the central question in the study of gene regulation, right? I mean, which gene is going to get turned on, okay? Which one controls the other genes, okay? Is how does the cell specify which of its many thousands of genes should be expressed as proteins, right? And this question is especially important for multicellular organisms such as ourselves. Because as the organism develops, many different cell types are created starting essentially from the same precursor cells. Right? So each one of us started from a single fertilized egg, but we have all kinds of cells, 100 trillion cells all right, of many different types in our bodies. All right? So the question is, how is that achieved? Right? Now, this differentiation right, into different types of cells arises because cells make and accumulate different sets of RNA and protein molecules. Right? For example, if you look at red blood cells, those are the only cells that produce hemoglobin, right? If you're looking, although every cell has information for producing hemoglobin, right? Similarly, every cell has information for producing insulin, but it is only the beta cells in the pancreas that produce insulin, because those are the only cells where this thing is turned on, okay? That gene for insulin is turned on. 
Now, uh, here is an experiment that was used to demonstrate that different cell types from the same organism contain the same genome, right? So you're trying to show that the skin cell from an adult frog, right, has the same genetic information, right, that you would need to produce a new frog, right? How can you do that? Well, you can take an unfertilized egg, right, frog egg, right? You use ultraviolet light to destroy the nucleus, right? You know that if you use ultraviolet light, uh, you know, you're going to get thymine dimers. Give a heavy dose of it, the nucleus is gone, everything is messed up, right? So this, this cell no longer has the, has the information that is needed to produce a new tadpole, right, or a new frog. So then you inject the nucleus from a skin cell of an adult frog, right? Take the skin cell of an adult frog, isolate the nucleus. We now know about procedures that can be used to do that, right? I talked about centrifugation, sedimentation, and all those things. Okay, if you do that carefully, you'll get that nucleus. Put it inside the cell, right? So now you replace the original nucleus with a nucleus taken from a skin cell of the adult frog, right? Now go ahead and fertilize this egg, right? So this is an egg, fertilize it with a sperm, and then see if a tadpole will develop, right? It will not develop in every, every case, but even if in one case, all right, you see that a tadpole develops, that means the skin cells of this adult frog had the genetic information that was necessary to, uh, you know, develop an entire organism, right? And that's what people have seen. So tadpole develops in some cases. So that means <clears throat> each and every cell has got exactly the same genetic information, right? Everything except the reproductive cells. Now, many of the proteins that are found in cells are found in all cell types. For example, the proteins that are needed to make DNA polymerase, RNA polymerase, ribosomes, etc., have genetic functions and are found in all cell types because all the cells have to produce, replicate their own DNA if, they, if the cell is going to replicate, produce RNA, then do carry out translation and so on, okay? So, the, so these proteins will be found in all cells and they are called housekeeping proteins, right? And the genes that encode them are called housekeeping genes. On the other hand, there are certain proteins that are only found in specialized cells. For example, hemoglobin is made in reticulocytes, right, which are the cells that develop into red blood cells, but it cannot be detected in any other cell type. Although every cell, right, except the reproductive cells, has the gene for producing hemoglobin. Similarly, insulin is made exclusively by, by the beta cells in the pancreas. And the list goes on. So how, how does the cell control the production of protein? A cell can control the proteins it makes in four different ways. Number one, by controlling when and how often a given gene is transcribed. Okay? Because if you need a particular protein, then you will transcribe that, the corresponding gene. Then it can control how the primary transcript is spliced or otherwise processed. What is splicing? Anybody remember? Not you, okay, I mean others, yeah. Anybody remember what is splicing? See, in the case of eukaryotic cells, all right, the D, in the DNA you have coding regions, all right, that are called? Exons, yeah, and non-coding regions that are called? Introns, all right. So once the RNA has been transcribed, you have the primary transcript, but the introns are removed from the RNA, to produce the messenger RNA, right? And that process is called splicing. And as I said before, I, I, I mentioned that I think last time, or maybe in the, pre yeah, probably last time, I said that, you know, you can do the splicing in different ways. Let's say you have five different uh, exons with introns in between them, right? You could decide to take out only the introns, right? And you get one uh, messenger RNA. On the other hand, you might decide to take out two introns and one exon in the middle, right? Right? Or, or you might decide to take out all the introns and even some of the exons, all right? Then in that case, you'll get a different mRNA molecule and so on. So the cell can control how the primary transcript is spliced or otherwise processed, all right? That's step two. Uh, that's the second possibility. Then it can also select which mRNAs are translated by ribosomes. Remember, it's a long drawn out process. The mRNA has to come out, right, of the nucleus. Then the ribosome has to get on it and then things have to be added, uh, you know, there's an elaborate procedure that I discussed last time, right, in order for the translation to take place. So the cell could decide which mRNA should be preferentially translated, right? And then the last thing is, assuming that the protein has already been made, the cell could activate or inactivate proteins, you know, after the fact, right? And that can be done in, in uh, using enzymes 
that are called proteases in something like a, like a, a trash compactor, right, which, which is called a proteasome, right. I talked about that last time, and then, you know, each, each uh, protein that is to be digested in a proteasome will be tagged with some uh, other protein called what? You remember? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's a marker. It's called ubiquitin, all right. Okay. Any questions? Now, how is transcription control? Right. So usually, see, although the, you know the the, the um, uh, protein production can con be controlled at all these different stages, all right. The most efficient one will be to uh, do the co uh, control at the transcription stage, okay? Because there's no point in investing resources, okay, and energy into producing a complete protein and then dismantling it. Instead, it's better not to make it in the first place, all right? So the main control is exerted at at uh, step number one. So transcription is controlled by proteins binding to what are called regulatory DNA sequences. Now if you look at the promoter region of a gene, again the promoter is the portion preceding a gene where RNA polymerase gets on and starts transcription. So the promoter region of a gene attracts the enzyme RNA polymerase and correctly orients it to begin its task of making an RNA copy of the gene in question. Right? Now the promoters include the initiation site and a sequence of about 50 nucleotides that extends upstream from the initiation site. That means in the five prime direction. Remember, transcription takes place in the five prime to three prime direction. Upstream means it's further in the five prime direction, further up in the five prime direction. So this region contains sites that are required for the RNA polymerase to bind to the prom promoter, right? And in addition to that, there are regulatory DNA sequences, right? These are needed in order to switch the gene on or off, right? Some of these regulatory DNA sequences can be as short as 10 nucleotide pairs and act as simple gene switches which will respond to a single signal. And this occurs primarily in bacteria, right? So the control of gene transcription is relatively simple in, in the case of bacteria, but in the case of eukaryotic uh, organisms, it is much more complex. So other regulatory sequences can be very long, as many as 10,000 base pairs, and they can act as molecular microprocessors taking in several inputs to determine the transcription rate. So it's like a committee, right? Members of the committee voting and then the uh, decision being made whether to start transcription or not. Right? And this occurs in eukaryotic cells. All right, any questions? So in, in near the promoter region, right, you'll have a regulatory sequence, DNA regulatory sequence. Now these regulatory sequences, they cannot act by themselves, right? They must be bound by what are called gene regulatory proteins, which will recognize them. And gene regulatory proteins are of two types. They can either be activators or they can be suppressors. So by binding the, those specialized DNA sequences, gene regulatory proteins can either speed up transcription or they can halt transcription. Right. So repressors turn genes off. Again, turning genes off means putting an end to transcription. Right. Don't copy the DNA into RNA. While activators will turn genes on. Right. And if you're looking at bacteria, you usually have several genes under the control of a single promoter, right? So this is the promoter region, and here you have gene uh, like D, E, C, B, A, all right? These are all genes that have to be transcribed in order to produce, let's say, the amino acid tryptophan, right? So this region uh, produces, uh, you know, some part of, of tryptophan. This one produces something else, all right? Or, or, or I'm sorry. This one produces one enzyme number one that's needed for tryptophan production. Right? Tryptophan is one of the amino acids, right? This one produces enzyme number two, enzyme number three, and so on, okay? So you have several of these genes under the control of a single promoter, right? So what you would want is if the level of tryptophan in the cell is low, right, the transcription of, the, of these uh, genes should take place. The enzymes needed for tryptophan biosynthesis should be produced, and tryptophan will be produced, right? On the other hand, if the level of tryptophan is high, right, you don't want any more tryptophan to be produced. So these genes should not be transcribed in that case, right? And that's what uh, this tryptophan operon accomplishes. So inside the... So an operon is basically several genes that are transcribed as a single mRNA molecule. They are under the control of a single promoter. That's what you will see in bacteria, right? If you're looking at human cells or eukaryotic cells, you'll have, uh, you know, each gene will be, will be transcribed as a single messenger RNA. You won't have this situation. Now, if you look inside the promoter region, there is also a DNA regulatory sequence. 
Now, when a replacer molecule comes and binds to this sequence, right? so inside this region, there's a DNA regulatory sequence. Uh, so if, if the replacer molecule comes and binds here, RNA polymerase doesn't have room to get on the promoter. right? So it cannot do the transcription. right? So that's how the repressor works. Now, the repressor has got this characteristic that it will bind that DNA regulatory sequence only after it has bound several molecules of tryptophan. So if tryptophan is an excess, all right, it will, it will bind several molecules of tryptophan all right, and prevent RNA polymerase from getting on over there. Okay. So the repressor molecule can bind this sequence only if it also binds several molecules of tryptophan. If the level of tryptophan in the cell is low, all right, then the repressor cannot bind tryptophan, right? several molecules of tryptophan, so it'll get off this thing and let RNA polymerase do the transcription. Right? So when the level of tryptophan in the cell is high, the transcription of the operon stops. On the other hand, when the level of tryptophan in the cell falls, the repressor is no longer able to bind the regulatory sequence, and so RNA polymerase can start transcription of the operon so that more tryptophan can be produced. Right? And uh, the tryptophan, uh, this tryptophan operon is an example of what is called an allosteric protein, right? Because, uh, you know, the, the tryptophan, uh, uh, that repressor, right, it is supposed to bind, bind to the DNA regulatory sequence, right? When it binds tryptophan, that alters the shape of the molecule a little bit, right? So it, tryptophan binds at a different site, right, than the DNA binding site, right? But it alters the shape enough so that uh, the repressor is no longer able to bind uh, the DNA regulatory sequence. Right? And the tryptophan repressor protein is always present in the cell, although at a low level. Right? And such unregulated gene expression is known as constitutive gene expression, as opposed to induced gene expression, which occurs in response to some stimulus. Okay. And I, I'm not covering that here, right? but there is similarly another very famous operon, which is called the LAC operon. Right? That is the lactose operon. And I noticed that the earlier version of this book didn't have that, but this time they have both tryptophan operon and also the lactose operon. Okay. And the, in the lactose operon, again, it's the same kind of situation. Right? If in the environment it, has got, uh, it, it detects lactose instead of glucose, it needs to induce the transcription of, of those uh, genes that are needed for metabolizing lactose. Right? Because lactose, if you remember, was made up of galactose and glucose. Right? So you have to break them up. Right? So if you take a look at the book, you will also uh, see a discussion about the LAC operon or the lactose operon, which was discovered, I think, in the 60s, all right, by Jacob and Menard. And for that, they got a Nobel Prize, right? maybe in 63 or something like that. So we discussed the repressor, right? In, in the case of the tryptophan operon, it has a repressor. Similarly, you can have activator proteins also, right? Because you could have some, uh, some uh, genes for which the promoter region is not uh, very functional. It, it's not, I mean, RNA polymerase can get on there, but it's not very conducive for, for starting transcription, right? So the activator protein, right, could bind to the, to that, to the regulatory sequence, right, in that promoter region, and it can, it, it can uh, you know, make this gene more suitable for transcription, so that when RNA polymerase gets on, it can, it can go ahead and do the transcription, right? So just like you have repressors, you can have activators. And an example of an activator protein is what is called CAP or cat catabolic activator protein, right? Because if, see, okay, when the level of, when the energy level in the cell is low, okay, what do you expect? What kind of molecules are you going to see in the, in the cell when the energy level is low? Hmm? Go ahead. No, no, mitochondria is, uh, no, mitochondria is there in the cell, right? Mitochondria is, is one of the sites where energy generation takes place. But I'm saying if the energy level in the cell is low, right, what kind of molecule are you going to see in abundance over there? Oh, go ahead. ADP and AMP, all right? And I discussed one molecule earlier, right? I call, I call it cyclic AMP, if you remember, right? Where you have AMP where, you know, from the 5 prime end, it basically bonds to the 3 prime end of the sugar on the same molecule, that's a, that is a signaling molecule, the cyclic AMP. So if, if the energy level in the cell is, is low, all right, you will have cyclic AMP that is produced. That turn, turns out that, uh, that when cyclic AMP binds this catab catabolite activated protein, right, that acts like an, uh, you know, uh, that basically stimulates transcription of genes 
that are needed for metabolizing the sugars. Because if the, if the energy level is low, right? See, like, for example, if your energy level is low, right, your blood sugar is low, you feel hungry, you eat, right? So the cell has to do the same thing, right? If the energy level is low, then the cell has to start burning glucose to produce energy, right? And this catab catabolite activator protein is, is an example of that, that if it binds cyclic AMP, right, it's going to get activated, right? Because the energy level is low, right? The cyclic AMP that is in excess, it is going to get activated, it's going to make the prom promoter more functional, and then it'll cause the transcription of genes that are needed for breaking down sugars and producing more energy. All right, any questions? So cyclic AMP is connected to its own sugar? Yes, yeah. So you have an AMP, so you have a 5 prime end and you have a 3 prime end, right? I mean, so the phosphate actually is connected to its, that's why it's called a cyclic AMP, the 3 prime uh, on, the, on the sugar, yeah. And that is a signaling molecule. If you have that, that is signaling to the cell that, hey, you better get to work, you know, you better start firing on all cylinders and produce more energy, you know, and that happens. Now, the initiation of gene transcription in eukaryotic cells is a complex process, right? In eukaryotic cells, it has to be done almost by a committee. Here, it's like one repressor, one activator in the case of bacteria. In eukaryotic cells, it's a lot more complicated. So, we next discuss the differences between initiation of transcription in prokaryotes and eukaryotes. First of all, prokaryotic cells contain one single type of RNA polymerase, while eukaryotic cells have three different types of RNA polymerases that are called RNA polymerase 1, RNA polymerase 2, and RNA polymerase 3, right? RNA polymerases 1 and 3, they will transcribe the genes that encode the transfer RNA. Now you guys know what transfer RNA is, tRNAs, we talked about that, okay, in the, in the protein production machinery, you need that, right? Then uh, they also encode the ribosomal RNA, that is the RNAs that form part of the ribosome, right, which is the protein making machinery, and the small RNAs that play an, a structural role in the cell, right? RNA polymerase 2, on the other hand, it trans transcribes the vast majority of eukaryotic genes, including all those that encode proteins, right? So that's one difference between eukaryotic transcription and prokaryotic transcription. So here you have three different types of RNA polymerase in, in the case of eukaryotes, and in particular, RNA polymerase 2 is the one that is going to transcribe the genes that are going to be translated into proteins later. Now it turns out that eukaryotic RNA polymerase 2 cannot initiate transcription on its own, right? To initiate transcription, eukaryotic RNA polymerase requires the help of a large set of proteins called transcription factors. A lot of things had to have to assemble at the transcription site in order for eukaryotic transcription to begin, right? It's not as simple as the operon, okay? So these, uh, these, trans uh, these things that are called transcription factors, they are thought to position the RNA polymerase correctly at the promoter to aid in pulling apart the two strands of DNA to allow transcription to begin and to release the RNA polymerase from the promoter once transcription begins, right? And the assembly of transcription factors and their role in initiating transcription at the appropriate location are shown in the next slide, okay? This is just a schematic diagram, right? So here you have the DNA, right? That is going to be transcribed. So this is, the, this is called a Tata box, TATA -TA sequence, right? That indicates like, uh, yeah, the start of transcription, right? So here, RNA polymerase, so RNA polymerase is this fellow, okay, that is looking like a mouse. Uh, so some other transcription factors assemble here. And you, we don't need to know the details, but a whole bunch of things, TBP, TF2D, and all that stuff will assemble here. Then uh, after that, the RNA polymerase is going to get on, right? See, all these things have assembled here, RNA polymerase is here. And then for the transcription to begin, right, there is some, uh, this RNA polymerase has to be phosphorylated. So there's some kinase, all right? Remember, kinase is phosphorylating. And that is going to release this fellow from the, all the transcription factors and let the transcription begin. So unless all these fellows come and assemble, all right, at the uh, transcription initiation site, all right, just having RNA polymerase is not going to result in transcription, right? And these factors might be transcribed by other genes, okay? So there might be other genes that might be controlling whether transcription will take place or not, okay? So in particular, uh, there is this factor that is TF2H, okay, that we'll talk about, because that's the last step in the initiation of transcription. So once that complex that I showed you in the earlier figure has assembled, the general transcription factor TF2H, which contains a protein kinase enzyme as one of its subunits. Again, remember, protein kinase 
Kinase adds a phosphate group. Phosphatase removes the phosphate group, right? So this uh, TF2H has got protein kinase activity. That will phosphorylate the RNA polymerase. So somewhere on the RNA polymerase, some phosphate group is added on. Remember, the phosphate group, if you, if you add a phosphate group to a protein, phosphate group means two extra negative charges. That will change the shape of the protein and will alter its activity. Right? In this case, it will lead to the start of transcription. So this phosphorylation is thought to help the polymerase disengage from the cluster of transcription factors and allowing transcription to begin. So it's like a whole committee, you know, unless the committee votes in some majority way, you know, transcription cannot start. Another characteristic is that in eukaryotic cells, the gene regulatory proteins can influence the initiation of transcription even when they are bound to DNA thousands of nucleotide pairs away from the promoter. So you could have uh, the promoter region here with the TATA box, right, TATA box, and then you could have a protein that is, uh, you could have a DNA sequence that is, let's say, 10,000 base pairs, pairs away, right? And here there is some activated protein that binds, okay? That can acti activate transcription here. How? Again, I mean, this is a schematic diagram. You have the entire machinery that has assembled, and this fellow is giving its input just with the DNA thing rolling back on itself, right? Coming, coming in contact with this RNA polymerase here, right? This is something you will not see in the case of bacteria, right? In the case of eukaryotic cells, you'll see that. Finally, eukaryotic transcription initiation must also take into account the packing of DNA into nucleosomes and more compact forms of chromatin structure because it's very compactly packed, right? So before the transcription can start, you know, things have to open up, right? So it is believed that the nucleosomes prevent the general transcription factors of RNA polymerase from assembling on the DNA and can therefore hinder the initiation of eukaryotic transcription, right? But you can get over, you can unpack them a little, little bit, maybe, by, maybe if they are methylated, right? There, there might be an additional level of uh, either hindrance, all right, or something helping transcription. Acetylation, deacetylation, those can alter the structure, right? And uh, either make transcription easier or, or difficult, right? Again, I mean, we're not getting into the details, I'm just letting you know. Then in ad addition to the DNA, there are epigenetic modifications that can affect uh, the, the initiation and, and continuation of transcription. Right. Now, in the case of most bacterial genes, all right, the control is exerted by a single activator or repre repressor protein as far as transcription is concerned. On the other hand, as I've been saying, most eukaryotic gene regulatory proteins work as part of a committee of regulatory proteins, all of which are necessary to express the gene in the right cell in response to the right conditions at the right time and at the required level. Right? For example, like, I mean, if you're a human being that is developing in the, in the womb, right? at the end, right, you should be having five fingers, all right? hopefully not six. Right? And like, you shouldn't have your fingers all you know, sculpted together. Right? So, there are, so the appropriate genes have to turn on and off at the right location, both in time and space. Or if, you, if you're looking at a cow or a bull, all right, the horns have to grow on the head. They should not be growing anywhere else on the body. Right? So the gene expression has to be controlled pretty t tightly. So this uh, control of gene expression is referred to as combinatorial control. And it is similar to Boolean logic, familiar to most engineers. You know, like for, to double easy, you're familiar with Boolean logic. Like if you have an AND gate, no matter what the, I mean, if one of the inputs is zero, right, then the output is zero, right? So you might have everything else, all but one, but you're still not complete, right? So indeed, using Boolean functions to model relationships between expressed genes is a theme that we'll en we will encounter in later part of this course. You know, so we are going to use Boolean networks, all right? to model genetic regulatory networks, right? Because through these transcription factors, genes will be exerting control on each other, right? And the challenge here is that we did not build this, okay? So we don't know the detailed control. All we ha will have is just data. And based on that data, data and, you know, prior knowledge in the form of, you know, what observations others have made, based on that, we'd like to build up models, right? And use them to make cells behave in a, in a way that we desire. Now, in the case of eukaryotic cells, combinatorial control of gene expression can create different cell types. For example, if you're looking at fibroblasts, which is one group of uh, cells that make up uh, cells that lead to connective tissue, these fibroblasts can be converted into myoblasts, which are the cells that are used for making muscle. 
by expressing just one gene in them, the gene which is called myosin D. Right? It appears that fibroblasts, which are derived from the same uh, broad class of embryonic cells as muscle cells, they have already accumulated all the other necessary gene regulatory proteins required for the combinatorial control of the muscle-specific genes. And if you just add this missing ingredient, it's like an AND gate, okay? Everything else is on, just add the last guy and the switch turns on, right? So addition of myosin D completes a unique combination which will direct the cells to become muscle. And here I have a hypothetical example because most of you here are double E's, okay? So you can see how by, you know, turning genes on and off, you can get different cell types. Like on the left, you have a hypothetical cell, let's say, with just three genes, right? All of them are not expressed. So in the first step, you turn on, let's say, gene number one, right? So 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0. So now you have two different cell types. Then you go ahead and, and, and uh, you know, work on the second gene. Either turn it on or keep it off. Now you have, like, two cell, t cell types here, another two cell types here, right? So in three steps, right, if you do that three times, you'll have eight different cell types. Okay, but just by turning genes on and off. So in three, three rounds of cell division, you will have up to eight different cell types. And really, there are many more genes. Like if you're looking at the human genome, maybe there are 20,000 genes, right? So if you turn these genes on and off, you can have many different cell types. Now, some highly specialized cells will never divide again, and uh, once they have differentiated. For example, the nerve cells or the neurons, they don't divide again. That is the re reason why if you have a spinal injury, right, you're paralyzed for life because those cells do not divide and, you know, repair themselves and so on, okay? Uh, but there are many other differentiated cells, such as liver cells, that will divide many times in the life of an individual, right? All these cell types, right, that you have, they give rise only to cells like themselves. If you take a liver cell and you make it divide, it will produce another liver cell, okay? and not, not uh, you know, a kidney cell, all right? This means that changes in gene expression that give rise to a differentiated cell must be stored in memory and passed on to its progeny through all the subsequent cell divisions, all right? And cells have different ways of accomplishing this. One possible mechanism involves a positive feedback loop, where a key gene regulatory protein is going to activate transcription of its own gene, right? In addition to that of other cell types specific genes. And the transcription of this gene, gene regulatory protein ensures that when the cell divides, this particular protein will be there even in the daughter cell, so right? Making it differentiate into that particular cell type. Right. In another mechanism, the condensed chromatin structure. Remember, we talked about heterochromatin, right? So the condensed chromatin structure in heterochromatin is faithfully propagated from parent to daughter cell, even though DNA replication is happening in between, right? And an instance of that is the inactivation of one X chromosome in female mammals, something that we have already discussed. All right, any questions? So now we have a, an example to conclude this chapter, all right? And this is an experiment to demonstrate the, that the alteration of the expression status of a single gene can trigger the development of an entire organ and that too at an abnormal location. Now, there is a gene called EY in flies, right, in fruit flies, and PAC6 in vertebrates is crucial for eye development, right? So, in this particular experiment involving fruit flies, the gene EY, right, that is needed for eye development is expressed early in development using artificial means. Since the 1970s, we have uh, the tools to do that, okay? And, and that will be discussed in a later chapter. So, using these artificial means in cells that normally would have gone on to form the legs, of the, of the fruit fly. The result is that in the corresponding fruit flies, you are going to have eyes develop in the middle of the legs, right? So you can do all kinds of things, right? I mean, it's not a good thing to do, right? I mean, and nobody's going to let you try and do that with humans or something like that in like grow a 10 headed, um, because, and even uh, with these organizations like NIH and so on, right? Even if you're doing experiments with animals, you have to show that, you know, you have to number one, minimize the cruelty, right? then you have to show what benefit is going to come out. You know, you cannot just say that, you know, uh, I want to be a crazy person and produce a ten-headed dog or something like that, you know. The, you're not going to get the funding for that. You know, you'll get into trouble. So That's why in, in those departments, like, you know, a lot of times in engineering and all, sometimes you do something, you know, you don't ask your advisor, you take shortcuts and all that, right? Which probably is okay because you're not going to kill anybody. But in those departments, 
like the experiments, they have to get the, uh, the experimental protocol approved by, uh, you know, an animal use committee, right? And there can be very severe consequences for deviating from that, okay? Because you need permission from, and, you know, and the consequences could be that severe that, you know, the whole institution, right, could be barred from getting any funding from that organization in the future, right? Let's say you, let's say you are working with anthrax or something, okay, and you gave a protocol, right? And you, then some, uh, you know, careless uh, person doesn't fo follow that protocol. If that is reported, if that leaks out, then the university would, would be debarred, right? from getting any funding and, and possible other legal action, you know. So the consequences can be pre pretty serious because this is not a uh, child's play, you know. You're, you're dealing with, with serious life and death issues here. So this particular experiment shows that the action of just one gene, whose uh, regulatory protein, can turn on, on a cascade of gene regulatory proteins whose actions can result in the formation of an organized group of many different types of cells. Okay, any questions? Yeah, go ahead. I, I kind of have a, a similar thing to that. I mean, it's not exactly the same, but in the 1980s, when, when they were sort of beginning genetic engineering, they were trying to um, increase like, the yields of things like meat and things. And, and yeah, 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 yeah. They took human growth hormones and it didn't work, but mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. there's other sub factors in it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, p yeah, people do that, you know, you, you can make changes, all right? Like, for example, many of you have heard of the Green Revolution, like in India, all right? And uh, that was made possible by a, uh, by a, a scientist here at a and right? He got the Nobel Peace Prize. His name is Norman Borlaug. There is a center for him. And what he figured out was how to, you know, modify uh, wheat right, genetically so that the plant doesn't grow as tall, okay? So if it doesn't, the problem was if it was growing tall, it would fall over, okay? If it's shorter, he could fertilize it and increase the yield, right? So, and he's credited with saving more lives, all right? Uh, he saved like a billion lives, right? More than anybody in the in the last century or probably ever, you know. So, and he's one of Bill Gates's heroes. Okay, if you, if you read the book, yeah. So, and he was here at uh, he was a distinguished professor here at Texas A&M. You know, he died a few years ago. Like now he was 95 years old and all that. But he changed this agricultural uh, production by by altering uh, the genes. All right, any questions? Otherwise, we'll, we have a few minutes and let's move on to the next chapter, right? So th the next chapter is about genetic variation, right? So, so as I said uh, earlier, uh, while discussing chromosomes and gene regulation, that you can go ahead and make alterations, you can use artificial means, all right, to uh, make alterations in the genome, right? Uh, today we can do that. Since the 1970s, we are able to do that. We can manipulate DNA molecules, create new DNA, take DNA from one organism and mix it up with DNA from another and so on. But, uh, you know, prior to that, we didn't have that capability, right? And so the variation would arise uh, in a natural fashion, right? Like if you see some abnormality or something like that, right? That happens like random, uh, it's, it's just by random chance, right? And it, it happens naturally and you might have to wait a long time, right? It's variation over, on, a, on a much, much uh, larger time scale, okay? Now we can do it a lot faster in the lab. So in this chapter, we will basically talk about the different mechanisms by which, uh, you know, genetic variation can be introduced, both in prokaryotes and bacteria, as well as in eukaryotes, such as ourselves, okay? Um, and this genetic variation is necessary for surviving in a ch changing environment, right? Because if things change, if, you, if your genes are not modified accordingly, right, then you'll die, right? So in this chapter, we discuss mechanisms by which the DNA in organisms can undergo changes over a long period of time. Although cells grow to great lengths to maintain the integrity of the DNA, permanent changes in the DNA that are called mutations do accumulate over time, right? And in fact, the vast diversity of life that we see around us today has arisen through changes in the DNA that has, have accumulated over evolutionary time, right? This genetic variation or diversity refers to the genomic differences between different species, right, that we see on this planet, as well as between members of the same species, right? So let's note that even members of the same species have genomes that are quite different from each other, right? In fact, no two human beings have identical genomes. That means all those three billion letters are not identical, unless they happen to be identical twins, right? Now, it is generally believed that the conditions on this earth have undergone dramatic changes over billions of years, right? 
Thus, in order for life to propagate, it, it is essential that the survivors be able to adapt to changing conditions, right? So change or perish, you know, kind of. So it is believed that genetic variation, though not always beneficial, is responsible for conferring survivability in a changing environment. Right? One situation where genetic variation is not beneficial is in cancer, okay? Because if the genes get mutated, you know, then it can be spell disaster for the organism, right? But in general, it, it, it tries to confer survivability in a changing environment. Over there also in cancer also, the cancer cell is surviving, okay? That's why it's killing the patient, right? No, there are three main mechanisms by which genetic variation can arise. The first one is rare mistake, mistakes in DNA replication and repair, right? I said earlier when we discussed DNA replication that, you know, there is the proofreading activity, so you, mistakes are there, but they do happen, right? And the repair mechanisms also slow down with age. So there will be mistakes in DNA replication, right? And in repair. The second method is by the recombination of DNA and the activity of viruses and other mobile genetic elements that can move into and out of the DNA, right? That can make changes in the DNA. And the third mechanism is the reassortment of the gene pool of the species into new combinations during sexual reproduction, right? Because, you know, the, the number of different combinations that you can get is really, really huge. By the time we get to the end of this chapter, we will find out. So first we will look at genetic variation in bacteria, right? Among bacteria, E. coli is a model organism for genetic studies because it reproduces very quickly, right? E. coli is said to have what is called a haploid genome because it has one copy of each gene in its genome, right? Whereas we humans, we have two copies of each gene. Consequently, in the case of a bacterium like E. coli, the effect of a mutation at the gene level will immediately manifest itself at the observational or phenotypic level, right? In contrast, organisms such as ourselves are called diploid organisms, since our genomes contain two copies of each gene, right? If you look at plants, they're triploid, tetraploid, and so on, okay? They're haploid, uh, and, and in fact, they have generations in between them, like haploid and diploid generations, and then you can have, so they can have many copies of the chromosome, so it makes things a lot more complicated. So consequently, a DNA mutation in the case of humans in one chromosome will not necessarily result in an observable phenotype. So in this context, recall how an individual with only one defective beta globin gene right, does not exhibit the full-blown symptoms of sickle cell anemia. Remember, beta, beta globin is one of the subunits of what? Hemoglobin. Yeah. Now, E. coli, like other prokaryotes or like other bacteria, reproduces by what is called a fission type of cell division. Right? The DNA is going to replicate right, and the two identical strands of DNA. And again, remember, in case of bacteria, the DNA is organized in the form of a circular chromosome, right? So the circular chromosome will re replicate. There will be two circular chromosomes. They'll move to two ends of the dividing cell, then something will pinch in the middle, and the cell has divided, okay? Fission type of cell division. In fact, in the presence of sufficient nutrients, a population of E. coli will double in number every 20 to 25 minutes. So if you do the math, in less than a day, a single E. coli can produce more than 5 billion descendants. So almost as many human beings that you have on Earth, okay, in one single day. And then every time that a cell divides, right, the DNA has got to be replicated, which means that there is a possibility of some replication errors, right? And the r rapid rate of division of E. coli means that very large populations of E. coli cells in which D DNA mutations have occurred can be produced quite rapidly, right? If you're looking at humans and all that, mutation will take a lot longer, right? Other higher organisms, it'll take a lo lot longer. But E. coli is dividing so fast. Every time it divides, there's possibility of mutations, right? So what might uh, take billions of years, you can probably show it in a few days, right? If you're working with E. coli, right? And that's what the next experiment does, right? So E. e. coli can be quite easily used to demonstrate how DNA mutations confer uh, survivability in a changing environment. For example, consider the antibiotic rifampicin, okay? I have never been prescribed this one, so I don't know why they don't use that, you know, but it's apparently it's one of those anti antibiotics, all right? So like many other antibiotics, this drug will bind tightly to RNA polymerase, to bacterial RNA polymerase inside the E. coli cell, and, it'll, and will prevent it from transcribing DNA to RNA, right? So this inhib inhibition eventually blocks the synthesis of new proteins that the bacterium needs, and the E. coli bacterium dies. However, if you have a large population of E. coli, say you have a billion E. coli cells, okay, you've cultured them, and then you're treating them with bacteria, 
there will be some cells that are resistant to this antibiotic. Right? So if such a population is treated with this antibiotic, most of the cells will die. However, the, the, the resistant cells will survive and they will ultimately take over the population. Right? Because in a day, you're going to have a, like 5 billion, right? So they'll take over the population. The defampicin resistance here comes from mutations in the DNA, which allow RNA polymerase to transcribe. So some of the cells will be having mutations in the DNA. So for them, RNA polymerase can transcribe even in the presence of that antibiotic. The principle that we have just encountered here, namely the ability of antibiotics to block bacterial transcription, that is the basis for current day treatment of bacterial infections using antibiotics. That's why your doctor gives you antibiotics, okay? Because it is going to selectively ta target bacterial RNA polymerase. The reason that this treatment is ineffective against viral infections is because the virus is not a living object, okay? It doesn't have its own replication machinery. So uh, it, it doesn't have its own transcription and translation machinery that the antibiotic could have targeted, right? Instead, as we shall see, a virus actually relies on hijacking the replication machinery of the host cell in order to propagate itself, right? <clears throat> now, bacterial cells can also acquire genes from other bacteria. And if you mix a laboratory strain of E. coli uh, that lacks one of the enzymes for me, actually, let's stop here for today. You know? I think uh, this uh, slide will continue very well onto the uh, next lecture, right? Let's stop here for today.